Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. A highly sought after response from the DOJ. The U.S. Attorney General makes his first public statement on the FBI's raid of former President Donald Trump's home. Upholding the rule of law means applying the law evenly, without fear or favor. Former U.S. Representative Devin Nunes gives us his take on the FBI's Mar-a-Lago raid. He shares insights from his time as chairman of the House Committee on Intelligence. An armed man allegedly tries breaking into the FBI's Cincinnati office. Authorities exchange gunfire with him. New details still coming in. The IRS could get almost 90,000 new agents. Some raise concerns that they'll target certain groups. We hear from a former agent. The Reds and Cubs will play in a seemingly routine game, but in the cornfields of Iowa. Tonight, the Field of Dreams movie site will host a second MLB game. Attorney General Merrick Garland delivered a public statement for the first time since the FBI raided former President Donald Trump's home. Many were hoping he would explain the reason for the raid. NTD's Jason Perry is near Mar-a-Lago with more details. Jason. All right. Hello, Steph. I'm here right outside of Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence. Many people have been wondering what the Department of Justice was going to say about the FBI raid of this residence here. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland started off by saying that since he became attorney general, the Department of Justice was going to speak through its court filings and its work. Garland also added that he personally approved the decision to seek a warrant in the matter. He added that copies of the warrant and the FBI property receipt were provided on the day of the search to Trump's counsel, who was on site during the search. Here's that clip now. Federal law, longstanding department rules, and our ethical obligations prevent me from providing further details as to the basis of the search at this time. There are, however, certain points I want you to know. First, I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. Second, the department does not take such a decision lightly. Where possible, it is standard practice to seek less intrusive means as an alternative to a search and to narrowly scope any search that is undertaken. Third, let me address recent unfounded attacks on the professionalism of the FBI and Justice Department agents and prosecutors. I will not stand by silently when their integrity is unfairly attacked. The men and women of the FBI and the Justice Department are dedicated, patriotic public servants. Thank you. Garland said that earlier today, the Department of Justice filed a motion to unseal or make public the property receipt and search warrant relating to the raid of Trump's residence. That's all we have for now. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Jason. And we'll keep you updated on the latest developments of that story. And as the world waits to see what, if anything, the FBI found in its raid of Trump's home, heated debate about the legality and morality of the search continues. Earlier today, I spoke with former U.S. Representative and former Chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Devin Nunes, for his perspective. Devin Nunes, welcome and thank you for joining us. Stephanie, great to be with you. Now, Trump says the FBI didn't let his lawyers or other staff near the raid, and his son says that the agency tried to have the security cameras turned off during the search. What do you make of that? Look, all of this is very, very cloudy, very, very murky, and obviously wrong. So, you know, more and more will come out. President Trump but obviously is probably going to take his time and make sure that he comes out uh, after he's reviewed everything and after he has his legal team look at this. But look, we're just in very dark times for America, no question. And you're obviously very aware that this is just one federal investigation into Trump. He's been investigated by the FBI before over the now discredited allegations of Russia collusion. Do you suspect that these agencies like the DOJ and the FBI are targeting him simply for political reasons? 
Well, look, we know for sure back in 2016, he was definitely targeted by the Obama-Biden administration, uh, working with the Clinton campaign and working with dirty cops at Department of Justice and the FBI. I mean, that much we know. And a lot of the same cast of characters, it's a very good question, because a lot of the same people who were quote unquote Russia hoaxers, right? These were people that were out looking for nude pictures of Trump, P tapes, talking to all the fake news. These people have now been promoted into the Biden administration. So the whole idea that Biden doesn't know anything is preposterous. It's just not true. They know it. They're definitely targeting uh, President Trump because they don't want to run for president again. It's, it's that simple. Now, during your time in Congress, you were the Republican chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. You were outspoken very early on about the FBI's investigation of Trump's campaign. Do you see any parallels here with the FBI's raid of Mar-a-Lago? Yeah, look, it, no, nothing stopped. This investigation from, from probably late 2015 to early 2016, it's just been ongoing. Between the, the Democrats and their propaganda machine and the media, they have normalized this type of bad behavior that is that is perforated all the way through, not just the executive branch, kind of the permanent class, the Department of Justice, all the different intelligence agencies. Uh, that, you know, that's all happened. That's that's done. What what is new? What's happened? I think probably here in the last couple of years has been now it's it's actually moved up into the judicial branch of government. And so, look, we just saw a few weeks ago, a month ago, you had now Supreme Court justices were targeted. We had leaks of information from the Supreme Court first time in history. Now you have a raid on President Trump's house, the first time that's ever happened to any president in history for what appears to be complete nonsense. I mean, it's crazy if you just, I mean, look at the big picture of this. Mar-a-Lago is guarded by the Secret Service. For sure, what we know from reports is that the that is that the the FBI and the Department of Justice have been working with President Trump and his people and the Secret Service to make sure that if there was anything there that was classified, it was behind a, a, a locked door. And you've got the Secret Service, pr you know, protecting it. I mean, my gosh, I mean, this is it's, it's ridiculous. They're there 24/7. So this whole situation here. Uh, is wrong, and we're we're in a very dark chapter of American history that I didn't really think after the last few weeks that it could get any darker. But after what happened this week with the raid on President Trump, it's it's gotten a lot darker. So, do you think this raid is a continuation of what you've called the Russia hoax? Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's just all the same. It's just all one and the same. It's people that are after power trying to destroy their political enemies. That's all this is about, which is what happens in third world countries where one party works to destroy uh, the other party. And it's it's been nonstop for for five years against President Trump because look, he was a disruptor. He was he was not somebody from politics. He had never worked in Washington. And he came in and said, look, we're gonna do things differently. And he shocked the kind of ruling class in this country. Uh, and they've never uh, they've never forgave him. They never let him be president. I mean, imagine this, you had, he was under investigation by his own government for absolutely nothing that the other political party had created out of whole cloth. And so this is just more of that. They look for any little thing, you know, so clearly, you know, what happened here with, with you know, any type of documents that were brought over from the, from the White House. I mean, you can imagine you're, you're after four years being in the White House, you have all these people from the government come in, they box everything up, they move it over. And furthermore, you have a lot of the documents that were supposed to be declassified that President Trump did declassify. The ruling class at DOJ and the FBI supposedly says that those documents are not classified. And so I don't know if those are part of the documents that were at Mar-a-Lago, but I can tell you that I saw a lot of those documents uh, that I wanted out to the American people when I was you know, the head of the Intelligence Committee for the Republicans, and those documents are still not out. And by the way, they're not in the archives. So, and these are, this is information that involves the whole Russia hoax, the dirty cops, the Clintons, Obama, Biden, all of them, they're hiding these documents. Like I said, I wanna be clear, I don't know that those are the same documents that were at Mar-a-Lago, but I do know those documents were declassified by President Trump and they can't be found. Nobody's seen them. Devin Nunes, former US representative and chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Stephanie. 
And over in Ohio, police say an armed suspect tried to break into an FBI field office in Cincinnati this morning. The standoff with the suspect ended in the afternoon, but at this time it's unclear whether he's captured. The FBI said Thursday that an armed subject attempted to breach the visitor screening facility of their Cincinnati field office at around 9 a.m. Eastern Time. The FBI, Ohio State Highway Patrol, and local law enforcement began chasing the subject, who fled in a car. Officers contained the suspect in one area and exchanged gunfire with him in the afternoon. According to the Clinton County Emergency Management Agency, the suspect was wearing a gray shirt and body armor. Several highways in the area were closed during the chase, but Interstate 71 reopened later during the day. No police were injured, and it's unclear at this point what the suspect's motive was. Authorities are asking residents in the area to remain vigilant. And turning now to the IRS, will the agency start targeting middle-income Americans? Some are worried about the almost 90,000 new IRS agents in Congress's spending bill. But are those worries warranted? Our reporter spoke with a former IRS agent to find out more. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on Wednesday ordered the IRS not to increase audits of households making less than $400,000 per year. The move comes after people raised concerns that the Revenue Service could crack down on middle-income Americans. The IRS might receive $80 billion in funding, which will partly be used to hire 87,000 new agents. Yellen said the money and the agents should be used to improve taxpayer service and modernize outdated technology. But what if the IRS chooses to target middle-income Americans? Do they have that power? According to Michael Sullivan, former IRS agent, they can do that. But it's politicians, often the White House, making those decisions. IRS is not doing this by themselves. People have got to understand. They have got to have a congressional order or a, per, a congressional phone call. A few years ago, the IRS was accused of targeting groups with conservative-sounding names. The Revenue Service later issued an apology, saying it was wrong to focus on groups based on their names. Could that happen again? Sullivan says politicians from both parties sometimes use the IRS to crack down on certain groups. And if the Revenue Service gets an order from above, it has to follow it, or else people will lose their jobs. They can target farmers if they want. Uh, and go after all the farmers. They can do anything that they want to. However, Sullivan says the extra funding for the IRS is long overdue. IRS is so far behind in computer programs and in people and clerical jobs. He added there's probably 5 million tax returns the IRS still has to take care of right now. After Sullivan's time with the IRS, he founded the Sullivan Tax Group, assisting people to resolve problems they have with the Revenue Service. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. And over in Oregon, Governor Kate Brown had granted early release to nearly 1,000 prison inmates during the pandemic. District attorneys challenged that decision, but a state court sided with the governor yesterday, saying it's within her authority to do so. The Democratic governor granted clemency to close to 1,000 convicted inmates, including 73 convicted of murder, assault, rape and or manslaughter. She did this during the COVID-19 pandemic for inmates who were either medically at risk or had helped fight wildfires during 2020. Two district attorneys and families of crime victims challenged the governor's decision earlier this year. The Oregon Court of Appeals ruled Wednesday that the action was within the constitutional powers granted to the governor. They added that they were not called there to judge the wisdom of the governor's clemency, saying that is a political question. And coming up, a group gathers in D.C. to push back against efforts to change Title IX. They're describing it as a push to expand transgender ideology and silence anyone who opposes. And the average gas price falls below $4 a gallon for the first time in several months, partly thanks to lower oil prices. But will the trend continue? Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News.
Innovation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. Welcome back. There's an administrative push to change Title IX, and today in D.C., a group is speaking out against those efforts. They say the changes would strip rights and protections for many. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskopf with more. I'm here right outside of the Department of Education building in Washington, D.C., where a group of policy directors, attorneys, and more are pushing back against the Biden administration's efforts to reshape the way Title IX is interpreted. These people tell me that Title IX is being distorted in a way that infringes on the rights of individuals on many levels, including due process, free speech, and even the mental and spiritual health of each individual. Well, we can't even talk basic truths, and then you can be harassed by school administrations because you're speaking biological truths. That's a problem. The group is pushing back against a proposal to amend Title IX. Title IX is a 1972 civil rights law that prohibits sex-based discrimination in any education program that receives federal funding. Right now, the Department of Education aims to expand definitions of words like sex and sexual harassment in Title IX expanding sex to include gender identity, and in so doing, gutting protections for women and girls. The administration says the goal is to protect transgender individuals, but some who oppose this effort say it has much deeper and far-reaching implications. Bureaucrats are threatening to defund schools and religious schools and take away the financial aid of religious Americans and some tell us the impacts could be even more grave than financial repercussions. They say normalizing transgender policies in schools will have lifelong consequences for kids who could start hormones as early as eight years old. When you put them on these puberty blockers, when you put them on this cross-sex hormones, it's permanent. And so they end up down that road and that's where they have to go. I, I feel really bad for parents in this scenario because when they go to a doctor and the doctor says, hey, your, your child is dealing with a gender dysphoria, we have to set them on this path, otherwise they might kill themselves. You know, that's really emotionally manipulative. Critics say changes to Title IX won't get at the root of the mental health issue. This is a spiritual battle. It's not just a matter of philosophy versus philosophy. I mean, we're going to the very core of who we are as human beings. The group urges the public to visit the Federal Register and make a public comment on the proposed changes to Title IX. Public comments will end on September 12th. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And now, here's some good news for your commute. The national average for a gallon of regular gas is below $4 for the first time in months. AAA says it's at $3.99 today. The price topped $5 in June. AAA says demand for gas has been decreasing because people don't want to pay those high prices. Worth noting, half of the price of gas comes from the cost of oil. And now here to talk to NTD's Don Ma about gas prices is Tavi Costa. He's a portfolio manager at asset management firm Crestcat Capital. Tavi, thanks for coming on. So what factors are at play here? The national average of gas is $3.99 now, according to AAA. We, that's because of, 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 of a uh, function of what happened in the last three months, right? Everything in the commodity space is, is cascaded, meaning it's a domino effect. Everything is, in a way, interconnected. The last three months, we saw most commodities decline. 
We had copper prices declining. We had most of energy commodities decline. So right now, gasoline prices have actually come down significantly, but we should be thinking about the future. The future is um, the natural gas prices are on the upside right now, probably going to make new highs or very close to it. Uh, oil prices have been uh, coming back recently, uh, and that will at some point start driving gasoline prices higher too. Even though there has been some focus in gasoline prices being lower, the truth is is that most likely what we're going to see here is that uh, the commodity prices are still likely to continue to rise over time. Uh, that's that's a function of what's happening in the macro environment. So you mentioned we have to look to the future, right? So in a nutshell, are you saying three months from now, oil or gasoline prices are going to go up? I think there is I think there's a probability of that. And, and that's why I'm paying very close attention to natural gas prices. Uh, it is of my view that we're going to see much higher oil prices in the near future. I don't know if it's three months from now, six months or nine months, but I do think we're going to see higher oil prices. Uh, just think about one thing, Don. I mean, look at the, the, the overall pressure in the oil markets right now with the government selling close to 30 million barrels a month uh, in order to drive oil prices lower. And it was still seeing a pretty high oil price today, uh, even though we saw a decline from the highs. It still is holding up very well, but that's because of the supply issues are much more structural than most people believe. And so pay attention to what's happening with natural gas, because that's going to be a very important telling here, a very important signal of what's ahead for commodity prices. If that starts really breaking out, it's a matter of time to see other things beginning to uh, to move to the upside as well. Remember, in 2021, uh, right at the early stages of that, one of the first commodities to start moving, which one was it? it was lumber prices and then natural gas prices begin to rise. So you got to got to really focus in those movements in markets right now, because that can change the whole narrative. I see. Now you mentioned a number of points. Just one last question. What's your biggest concern for the oil market right now? Um, I think there are some concerns uh, regarding uh, some changes in geopolitics that I've been thinking a lot about. For instance, you know, I think what could drive my, my big question is what could drive commodity prices lower? What could drive oil prices lower as well? Um, I pay very close attention to the CapEx trend, which takes a very long time to reverse. I also pay very close attention to production numbers, which are not showing uh, that we're going to see any any real uh, uh, pressure from the supply side anytime soon. I pay very, pay very close attention to uh, geopolitics, even though geopolitics remain very bad in terms of the situation with Russia and Ukraine, the situation between U.S. and China. It's, it has somewhat improved from the beginning of, of March. Uh, and so uh, I think that had an impact on commodities. But the situation overall has not changed. We're entering a deglobalized world, in my opinion. If, if I'm wrong on that, I, then I think commodity prices won't be going higher. The inflation story may, uh, you know, will, will probably not disappear. It may decelerate over time, uh, like we saw in the 70s. We had wave, uh, waves of inflation during that time. And we saw most of the first wave, but that doesn't mean inflation is gone. It's probably going to remain a narrative. And that should also be fueling uh, uh, the prices of, of things like oil and energy commodities and other commodities in general. I see. All right. Thanks for your insight, Tavi Costa, Portfolio Manager, Crestcat Capital. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And inflation is also hitting food prices in Chicago. They are struggling to keep up with demand amid rising costs and a drop in donations. That means less food or less variety for families who depend on these food pantries. Here's the story. Demand for Chicago's food pantries is still above pre-pandemic levels, but with inflation at a 40-year high, donations are decreasing and there's less food to go around. Steve Wiley, manager of Pilsen Food Pantry, says demand has more than doubled. For the past two years, we've seen a steady growth. Pre-pandemic, roughly about two years ago, our numbers were around 180 families came to visit a week. We're currently looking at around 380 families per week. Wiley says they're not getting enough essential food items to service their clients. There are days when we have to ration some things. So some of the high demand items, say like rice, flour, cooking oil, you probably won't see those on the shopping list at the same time. So we have to spread it out over the course of the week until we get the next delivery. When we meet our capacity, 
which depending on our inventory might be 70, 80 families, we have to close the doors. Irving Park Community Food Pantry in Chicago serves about 100 families a week. John Cy Harris, executive director, says demand has dropped by 50% from the height of the pandemic in 2020, but it's still 30% higher than before the pandemic. With high costs, there's less variety to choose from. Not a single person was turned away um, because of lack of food. It may be that they're not getting everything that we would like to give them or that we don't have all of the options that we normally have. But if somebody comes in looking for food, at the very least, we try to give them some food uh, to take home with them. Cy Harris says rising costs also affect donations to the organization. Donations are coming in at a slower pace than they were in the past and at a lesser pace. So people that may be donated $500 every so often, they may now be donating $200. Both food pantries get most of their food supplies from the Greater Chicago Food Depository, a food bank in Chicago. Its spokesperson told NTD the organization is able to keep up with its demand, but has spent 55% more on food in fiscal year 2022 versus 2021, and it's spending more than triple compared to 2020. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News, Chicago. And volunteers have started filling up nearly 8,000 backpacks with scissors, pencils, and other school essentials. Those items will help prepare New York City public school students for the upcoming school year. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. About 160 of them will be working for the next two days at the Salvation Army's Harlem Community Center. They started on Wednesday. So we're packing a variety of really important and basic school supplies. You can see here we have crayons, we have markers of different types. Of course, in this classroom, you'll need things like rulers and notebooks and folders. Um, we're taking all of these supplies and putting them together in these awesome backpacks. TK Lee came with a team of coworkers from PricewaterhouseCoopers to help. I think it's important to come together in this time of a uh, you know trial and a challenging time for everyone, and to show everyone that uh, they're not alone, and uh, we can show them love uh, and you know this humanity, and then this world is still uh, it's a good place to live. Nonprofit New York Cares teamed up with the Salvation Army Greater New York Division for the initiative. The backpacks will be delivered to 30 schools and community partners in need across Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. Yes, this is actually very helpful for parents who, this is one less thing they have to worry about, you know, because they have to buy school clothes and, you know, snacks and things like that. So this lightens their hearts, lightens their minds, and this is really helpful for them. The National Retail Federation estimates that parents will spend over $800 on average for clothes, shoes, school supplies, and electronics. One of the things that is top of mind for consumers when they're shopping for back to school or college this season is inflation and higher prices. This is also New York Care's third annual Stand with Students campaign, a donation supported initiative that includes academic tutoring, school revitalization projects, and book distributions in neighborhoods such as Central Queens, East Brooklyn, and the South Bronx. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, Hollywood will be getting more police patrolling the city. That's after a year-on-year -year increase in crime, according to one councilman's office. And the Reds and Cubs are scheduled to play tonight, but it's no ordinary game. The teams will compete in the cornfields of Iowa in homage to a classic baseball film. NTD's Dave Martin has the details of tonight's Field of Dreams game. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times. I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff. I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for 
opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epoch Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. I'm so blessed to have been given the opportunity to take a refuge in America. After serving in the Army for 27 years, I retired to fight for our issues. Now I face a new battle, a battle to fix the injustices that plague our people. I will protect everyone's right. Let us join to force a better future for all Americans. I'm Yan Shang. I'm running for Congress NY10. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I made an assistant to help you prevent wildfires. Dude, I've got this. I've been camping since I was five years old. But I am a camping influencer. You know what, I'll bet you five bucks. Okay. Assistant Smokey, what is the best way to put out a campfire? Mm -hmm. To put out a campfire, drown with water, stir, drown again, then make sure the fire is out cold by feeling with the back of your hand. Wait, really? I'll take the five bucks. Hollywood will soon see an increased police presence after the Los Angeles City Council approved funding on Wednesday intended to address a recent increase in crime in the area. The Los Angeles City Council approved $216,000 in funding for more police patrols in Hollywood. That's to address a rise in crime. Mayor Pro Tem Mitch O'Farrell introduced the motion. He said last week, quote, if you plan to come to Hollywood to commit crimes, you are not welcome. O'Farrell added that Hollywood may be one of the most diverse cities in L.A., but on Wednesday, one public commenter accused the bill of targeting black people. According to statistics from the councilman's office, there has been a 75% increase in homicides and a 36% increase in shots fired this year compared to last year. Robbery was up 20% and theft up 25%. Blake Chow, deputy chief for the Los Angeles Police Department, said that they are looking forward to quickly employing these additional resources to prevent, deter, and address crime in Hollywood. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. California is piloting a new program to provide college savings funds for certain children. The youngest recipients of the funds will be newborns. NTD's Eileen Ang reports. Governor Gavin Newsom announced on Wednesday a $1.9 billion college savings program for 3.4 million low-income newborns and public school students. It's called the Cal Kids Program, and the purpose is to help them get a head start on college savings. The dignity that comes with that, the conversations you're gonna have with your kids you may have never had before because of this extraordinary opportunity, the largest program of its type anywhere, any jurisdiction, in any country. Babies Cal born on or after July 1st can get up to $100. Low-income school-age children in grades one to 12 can get up to $1,500. Parents can register their newborns to an online portal to create an account. In the disclaimer at the bottom of the website, it says, if the funds aren't used for qualified higher education expenses, a 10% federal penalty tax on earnings may apply. Non-qualified withdrawals may also be subject to an additional 2.5% California tax on earnings. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Lawyers gave their opening statements in Vanessa Bryant's case against L.A. County over photos from her husband Kobe Bryant's crash site. It's been over two years since the NBA legend Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter Jana, along with seven other people, died in a helicopter crash in California. In her federal lawsuit, Bryant claims county, fire, and sheriff employees shared photos of the crash in settings that were irrelevant to the investigation, including at a bar. She seeks undisclosed damages, claiming negligence, civil rights violations, violation of privacy, and emotional distress. L.A. County Sheriff Alex Villanueva said back in March 2020 that all the photos had been deleted 
and eight deputies were facing administrative action. I talked with Erin Solomon, chief legal analyst for Esquire Digital, about her case. Solomon says the burden will be on Bryant to prove she sustained this injury. The trick here is going to be causation, is linking those injuries that she suffered from the loss of her husband and daughter to the actions of the Los Angeles County officials. And that's what she's going to have to do at trial. Conversely, what the argument is going to be of the Los Angeles County uh, officials is that it was actually the crash scene itself that caused these intense and intensive emotional injuries, not the fact that their employees were sharing these pictures. Solomon says that the jury selection, which happened Wednesday, might be the biggest key for LA County officials because of Bryant's immense popularity. So you can imagine that the council for Los Angeles County is going to be, we don't really want the jury stacked with people who are like, Kobe is the GOAT. He's the greatest or second greatest basketball player ever. But you also don't want people who have views that are stacked on the other side. You know, it's not fair to have a jury that's full of people saying, well, if the Los Angeles County police did it, they've got to be wrong. Brian's case is expected to last for approximately two weeks. In baseball news, Major League Baseball's Field of Dreams game is back tonight for an encore performance. The Reds and Cubs are set to play at the site of the Field of Dreams movie location in Iowa. The players will again enter through the outfield cornfields as they did last year. The teams plan to wear throwback uniforms of more than a century ago to fit with the theme of the movie. The game won't actually be played on the field used in the movie though, which is now a tourist attraction. Instead, a new stadium was built nearby that features a manual scoreboard, seats for 8,000 people, and approximately 159 acres of cornrows surrounding it. Last year's inaugural event was a classic, highlighted by Kevin Costner's pre-game appearance. The actual game was a back and forth thriller with the Yankees scoring four in the ninth to take the lead only to lose it on a walk off home run by White Sox shortstop Tim Anderson in the bottom of the frame. Tonight's game starts at 7.15 Eastern Time. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And still to come, China's foreign ministry spokesperson is facing backlash over a food related tweet. She shared a map with a number of dumpling restaurants located in Taiwan and claimed it justifies Beijing's stance that the island belongs to China. And a series of blasts at a Russian air base in Crimea causing confusion. Ukrainian officials speculate over the cause. That and more after the break. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. What does a lineup of restaurants in Taiwan have to do with geopolitical tensions in China? It's about a tweet from China's foreign ministry. Let's take a closer look. Hua Chunying is a spokesperson and the assistant of China's Minister of Foreign Affairs. A recent Twitter post she shared is taking fire, and it has to do with tensions between Taiwan and Beijing. So here's the message. Baidu Maps, considered the Chinese version of Google Maps, showed that there are 38 Shandong dumpling restaurants and 67 Shanxi noodle restaurants in Taipei. That's Taiwan's capital city. Worth noting, China's Shandong and Shanxi provinces are famous for their dumplings and noodles. The tweet goes on to say, Palates don't cheat. Taiwan has always been a part of China. The long-lost child will eventually return home. Hua posted the tweet at a sensitive timing. That's amid the tension surrounding the Taiwan Strait, when Beijing is angered by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. 
her tweet sparked a flurry of mocking comments, with a long list of users using the post's own logic against it. Former U.S. State Department spokesperson Morgan Ortegas also joined in. She quoted Hua's tweet and wrote her own version. Her take reads, There are over 8,500 KFC restaurants in China. Pallets don't cheat. China has always been a part of Kentucky. The long-lost child will eventually return home. But that's not all. Bonnie Glasser is the director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund, a U.S. think tank. She replied to Hua's tweet as well. She wrote that the post shows how desperate Beijing is to identify something that Taiwan and China have in common, adding that economic interdependence hasn't promoted political integration and cuisine won't either. Now to the Russia-Ukraine conflict and a series of explosions at a Russian air base in Crimea. Kyiv denies any responsibility as Ukrainians speculate on the cause. After deadly explosions rocked a Russian airbase in the annexed Crimean Peninsula on Tuesday and questions over who or what caused the incident, Ukraine denied responsibility for the event deep inside Russian-occupied territory. Witnesses said they heard at least 12 blasts. Video obtained by Reuters showed a plume of smoke jetting into the sky. Crimea's health department, along with the Russian governor of Crimea, said at least one civilian had been killed and multiple others injured. But the cause of the blasts are still unclear. Russia's defense ministry brushed off the idea there had been an attack and claimed the blasts came from detonations of stored ammunition. A senior Ukrainian official suggested it was the work of partisan saboteurs, while another suggested Russian incompetence as a possible cause. Crimea is a holiday destination for many Russians. Moscow annexed the peninsula from Ukraine in 2014 as one of the launch pads for its invasion. Zelensky did not directly mention the blasts in his daily video address, but he said it was right that people were focusing on Crimea. And in the UK, a British man has been accused of being a member of an Islamic State terror cell known as the Beatles because of their British accents. The terrorist group is alleged to have detained and murdered Western hostages in Syria. NTD's Jane Wirrell has more for us. Moane Davis, a British man, was arrested in the UK on terror charges. Before being radicalised, he sold drugs and carried a gun, and he grew up in the West London borough of Hammersmith. He's accused of being part of a terror group called the Beatles, and they were given this name because of their British accents. Davis actually changed his name to Hamza when he converted to Islam. Notorious for their murders that were posted on the internet, the gang is accused of torturing and beheading Western hostages. It was led by Mohammed Amwazi, who became known as Jihadi John. Now, Davis was arrested in Luton after being deported by Turkey to England, and he served a seven and a half year sentence in Turkey for being part of that gang, and that's an allegation that he denies. And the Crown Prosecution Service has asked people not to post information online that would prejudice the case, as this is an ongoing trial in the UK. Jane Wirrell, NTD News, London. Coming up, San Francisco is taking a natural approach to slowing down a pigeon infestation on local public transit. We'll hear from the airborne security detail on how it works. And we time travel to the late 19th century Wild West for a shooting contest in Washington State. To kick off the event, participants even dressed up as cowboys. Find out more in just a minute here on NTD News. Welcome to RenBiz.com, the education and career program where parents rule. We replace public schools and universities. We are for ages 6 to 100. Never any big student loans with us. You graduate with a traditional diploma, a university degree, and your own family business. Adults returning to obtain better careers. Parents looking for better academic and career opportunities for their kids. At Business Vacation, you spend 50% of your time on traditional education and 50% on business education, including setting up your own family business. Learning is in your small in-person pods of 6 to 10 students. At Renaissance Business Vacation, aka RenBiz.com, graduation means you have a degree and your own family business. Like education always should have been, a transition to getting a career.
major transit system in San Francisco has, been, has employed a new, highly specialized station guard. And his target is hordes of pigeons that have been causing a nuisance at stops. NTD's Jackie Rios reports. San Francisco's Bay Area Rapid Transit System, or BART, has contracted a new station guard who has been patrolling the station in recent months. The guard's name is Pac-Man, a Harris Hawk. He's been on the lookout for pigeons at El Cerrito del Norte station. His mission is to keep pigeons under control in the area and protect commuters from pigeon droppings. Ricky Ortiz, a falconer and Pac-Man's handler, described the security detail. We work our way up here to the platforms and just check the ledges and the roof and make sure that they're not uh, trying to sneak in on us and uh, keep them out. And he, he does a pretty good job of that. Despite BART installing netting and spikes on station structure, the nuanced pigeons still managed to get through. Ortiz talked about how much of an impact Pac-Man is making. Just after the first week or so, we noticed a huge difference. Probably less than half of the pigeons were here after the first week um, of us flying, establishing the territory. One commuter acknowledged one reason for the pigeons being around is that commuters feed them. But having Pac-Man around helps to deter them. It's a neat way of, of curbing the pigeon problem. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that, that feed them. Uh, I, I know they're not supposed to, but, you know, it's not enforced. But this seems to be a good way to uh, keep them under control. One commuter, though, was unsure at first upon seeing Pac-Man for the first time. Oh, I was scared. I switched cars because I wasn't going to be trapped in a metal box with a bird of prey. <laughs> Ortiz noticed, though, for the most part, most commuters are pleasantly surprised upon seeing Pac-Man. Most of the commuters are pretty excited and, and happy to see him. Um, you know, most of them have a the, lot of questions. If Is it an eagle, falcon, what kind of bird, where is he from, what am I doing, <laughs> stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's fun to get to interact and educate the public. To keep Pac-Man happy, Ortiz will give snacks throughout the day. Also, it keeps Pac-Man from making a meal out of any pigeons or local rodents that might be hanging around. Jackie Rios, NTD News, California. And residents of New Orleans may have been wondering why there was no glass recycling in their area. And a couple of college students were thinking the same thing. So they decided to take action. It all started with a bottle of wine. We sort of just cracked this idea to, to do something about it and try to solve that issue, however small that something might be. And that's when we decided to start Glass Half Full. This is Francisca and Max from Tulane University, 24 years old and the co-founders of this recycling company, Glass Half Full. We started in that backyard, then we moved into a very small warehouse, and then we finally moved into the 40,000 square foot facility that we're currently in. So we just kind of took it small step by small step until we finally got to where we are today. Let's do it! Two years in, Glass Half Full would become the first glass recycling center in the city of New Orleans that collects sorts, scoops, shatters, and recycles by turning that glass into sand. Here in New Orleans, we're below sea level, so anytime there's a heavy rain, a storm, the city floods, essentially. And so sandbags are a really important line of defense for the folks in this city to protect their homes and businesses. So instead of using sand dredged from the Mississippi, they can use recycled glass sand. So um, the finest sand is really good for sandbags for disaster relief. The coarse sand is what we're using for coastal restoration projects. And then the gravel can be used for um, gravel. So in landscaping, water management, um, flooring, things like that. The Trailblazer and her team have so far recycled almost 2 million pounds of glass. I think the main reason we were... Um, able to jump into action so quickly was really because of how naive we were. <laughs> um, we didn't have any recycling or waste management experience and instead of sort of um, focusing on the negatives and what we didn't know, we focused on what we wanted to do 
and just sort of started and did it and learned along the way. But not without sacrifice. We had our college friends like, hey, instead of going out and partying on Saturday, what if you came and recycled glass with us? And the community got right behind them. $150,000 in crowdfunding led them to the 40,000 square foot facility that they're currently in today with 10 employees. It makes me feel amazing. Getting out there and like getting my hands dirty and really doing the work makes me feel so much more passionate and positive about, you know, the outlook and what our future holds. So maybe all we really need is a glass half full attitude to get our plan started and then watch them grow. And if you happen to pass by the Renton Fish and Game Club in Washington State on Saturday, you may have thought you traveled back to the late 19th century. The venue is hosting an annual cowboy shooting competition. So let's take a look. The Renton Fish and Game Club, about half an hour from Seattle, played host to cowboy action shooting this past Saturday. It's an annual firearms competition that sees its participants dress up in cowboy costume. To compete, they use vintage firearms on various old-fashioned themed courses. The Renton Club is part of a global single-action shooting society which sets rules and regulations for the sport. The course of fire usually entails two six-shot revolvers, only loaded with five each, however, uh, a lever-action rifle in pistol caliber, and a shotgun. You can use either a double-barrel shotgun with or without hammers, or uh, uh, if you want to use a pump shotgun, it has to be an 1897 Winchester or a copy thereof. The shooting sport is based on cowboys and the idea of the Old West. Competitors use firearms that were prevalent in 1873 or copies of them. It's a contest that requires attention to detail, speed, and accuracy. And it's a timed event. So if you shoot the stage correctly, your total time is your score for that stage. If you miss a target, just flat miss it, they add five seconds to your score. If you shoot it outside the prescribed order, they add 10 seconds to your score. So, you know, uh, you go as fast as you can without making any errors. Many competitors return each year and remain devoted to the community. Aside from keeping score, they revel in the social aspect of the event. We all have the same um, commonality in the sense that we enjoy the sport, we learn from each other, we share our tactics with each other, we are competing either in age categories or in dress categories like I am, but we're still there rooting for each other. I'm an extrovert and be around other people, dress up, act kind of goofy, and not be laughed at because we're all doing the same thing. The event even made room for a child competitor, 10-year-old Braxton Buddy Wainwright per year. And finally, Lego is going big to celebrate its 90th birthday today. It unveiled a massive birthday cake made of Lego, featuring a whopping 94,128 bricks and pieces. This video shows all the work employees did to build the nine-layer cake, one layer for each of the nine decades of Lego play. It's on display at the Lego house in Denmark. The company is also celebrating with its first World Play Day, complete with events around the world to encourage and help families and communities play more. Danish carpenter Ole Kirk Christiansen founded the company in 1932, and it's still family-owned. The Lego brick in its current form was first manufactured in 1958. Oli's son helped develop it. The company produces roughly 100 billion bricks each year and employs around 24,000 people worldwide. Lego, by the way, comes from the British phrase which means play well. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.